welcome to Depth Insights, where we take a depth psychological look at the news, events, and phenomena that are going on in your world today. I'm your host, Bonnie Bright, and I'm also the founder of Depth Psychology Alliance, which is an online academic community for those who are interested in depth psychology and also in the psychology of Carl Jung. And I'm here with Dr. Michael Conforti, who is the founder and director of Assisi Institute, which has been around for almost 30 years now. The Assisi Institute is primarily a training institute which specializes in archetypal pattern analysis. And I know Dr. Conforti as a pioneer in Psyche Matter Studies. He is an author, a Jungian analyst, maintaining a private practice in Vermont. And he also has been a faculty member at the C.G. Jung Institute in Boston, the C.G. Jung Foundation of New York, and was also a senior associate faculty member in the doctoral and master's program in clinical psychology at Antioch. Dr. Conforti has a long history of investigating the relationship between Jungian psychology and the new sciences and has presented widely all over the globe. Dr. Conforti, it's great to have you here. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Bonnie. It's a pleasure. It's a really pleasure to be working with you. Yeah, me too. It's been uh, really great. We've had a really wonderful run so far. Uh, our organizations have worked together really well over the past year. Depth Psychology Alliance and Assisi Institute seem to have a very natural kind of flow between them. And, um, of course, several members of the alliance made it to the Assisi Conference in Assisi, Italy this year, which was absolutely fabulous. So I really wanted to thank you for all the hard work that you put into that and making it a really, really remarkable event this year, and I'm definitely looking forward to being in Assisi again with you in 2012. Well, I'm glad you can do it again. I'm ready to get my tickets tomorrow. I, want to, I can't wait to get back. <laughs> Me too. And, and you know, somehow <laughs> the whole archetype of transcendence really was consolidated this year. I think it was felt by all of us. How we did it, only Absolutely. God knows, but it, it was there. Yeah, it was, it was really one of the most special conferences that I've ever attended, and, and I do think that there's something cooking in the world today that really makes the power of archetypes even more apparent. And since that's one of your specialties, I, I'm really grateful for your expertise and the insight that you're able to offer into archetypes. And that leads us to what we want to talk about today, which is an upcoming program that you have starting right away, actually, uh, in late September, and that is your dream patterning program. So uh, dreams, of course, are, are heavily archetypal, and I'm sure that you will have a lot of examples for us to talk about. But can you just take a few minutes here as we start out and talk about the dream patterning program, what dream patterning is? It's a very unique name and where it came from and, and what it is that you intend to offer. Well, actually, we just began the dream patterning program last year. It was a maiden voyage because I thought, you know, all the work I've been doing on the objective psyche, on dreams, especially on patterning, it was a perfect confluence. I said, you know, let's try this program because I've been doing this work, and, and it just it took off so well. We had about 24, 25 people on a maiden voyage. And it was so interesting in that we just we finished the program. We were finishing in June of this year. It's a nine-month training program. And as we were getting ready, maybe the last three sessions, you know, begin to, to termination, talk about ending and all that, people said, why are you talking about ending? I said, because we're ending, aren't we? And they said, <laughs> we're not ending. We're not going anywhere. We're, we want an advanced program. I said, okay. So I designed the program, and we have an advanced program beginning actually this coming Wednesday. And it's going to be a continuation of the people of the training we did last year. So people that have one year of the beginning dream patterning under their belts, as well as people that are in, in advanced standing in our training program, the Archetypal Pattern Analyst Program, are going into the advanced program. And then we're beginning the, uh, the other new program in late September. Now, what is it, okay? By way of a story, sometimes in life, if we're really lucky, we meet somebody great. We meet a great teacher and a mentor whose ethics, whose morality, whose vision transforms our life. I was fortunate I had that. And I was working with a man in New York named Dr. Yoram Kaufman. He wrote The Way of the Image. I'm sure many members in the uh, Depth uh, Psychology Alliance know the book. Uh, it's one of the probably the best book ever written on the objective psyche. Well, I, was, I worked with him for 10 years off and on as a supervisor. And he was a physicist in Israel where he came from, and then went to New York and trained as a psychologist, and then a Jungian analyst. A true infanterib, you know the expression, and absolutely brilliant. And what he did with dreams, and I'll never forget, 
it was probably my first year or second year in the uh, Jungian training program in New York. Somebody presented a dream of one of their patients. And Dr. Kaufman, from the dream, and the way he would work is he would say, I don't want you to tell me anything about the analysis, you know, the candidates work with the patient. I don't want to know anything about the history of the patient right now. I want to demonstrate, he would say, how much one can do by understanding the archetypal underpinnings of a dream and by looking at what he called the orient and the dominant of an image. So a woman presented this dream, and it was a, a, a terrible dream. A woman is going for gynecological exam because she's pregnant. And in the dream, a doctor takes this giant, giant, like, floodlights and looks inside. Yoram heard the dream. He was enraged. He said, who are you talking with about this case, and what are they telling you? Because whatever they're telling you, it's all wrong. And we're looking saying, what is this man talking about? Because we were new to the seminar. And he said, a gynecologist should never oh, exp- open something like this up. Something as precious and beautiful. Of course, you have to look and see and feel and all that stuff that a trained gynecologist would do. But to go in with a giant spirit saying some terrible sense of exposure is happening and terrible violations. Mm-hmm. And he said, who's ever talking to you, they are destroying this case. And, and I've got to tell you, Bonnie, he didn't know one thing about what was going on in the therapy because it was a candidate coming and presenting a case that they were working on for a couple of years. Uh-huh. Well, the candidate broke down and cried and cried and sobbed. Okay. And she told us a story where she was working with another supervisor. And the supervisor was forcing her to make interventions on a patient she had. And while she disagreed with every intervention, she felt she had to do it or else she was going to be scolded, got into a lot of trouble or whatever. And she said, I disagreed with everything my supervisor, not Dr. Kaufman, her own personal supervisor, had been telling her. And Kaufman said, if you want to protect the birth, that baby, you cannot expose it to this stuff that this Uh supervisor. He said, you should terminate tomorrow. So that's a Terminate really that powerful situation. insight that um, Dr. Kaufman was able to to really tap into that with only, and I, I say only because a lot of us in day-to-day life have dreams on a daily basis, and we know the images, we remember the images, we can recount the images, but we have absolutely no idea what they mean. And he was so quick to pick up on something that was so vitally important so can you just talk a little bit about where are those, I mean, a lot of people in the depth psychology community understand and know the power of the image, but can you talk a little bit about where those images come from and how on earth he was able to make that kind of an assessment or have that kind of insight in, in such a, 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 you know, as such a flash of insight, really? Well, in many ways, the work I've been doing in archetypal fields really has provides a, a, a a flushing out and a backdrop and a real, I think, a very meaningful extension of what Kaufman did. Because he, he would just make these comments, like, say, as you're asking, where would you get that from? Now, when you right. ask where do symbols come from, where do images come from, this really is the bulk of what my work has been about for the past 30 years. An image is an expression of a field. A field is, is a domain not limited by time and space. It's a domain of experience, a field of victory, a field of defeat. A field of dreams, the the wonderful, the good mother field, the terrible mother field, the field of the of the sister, the field of the Athena archetype, and when you begin to 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 realize, okay, let's think about the field of Athena. Suddenly, you realize, you know what? In that field, there are highly specific pieces. Athena is not Medusa. Athena is not Hera. Athena is not, you know, let's talk about a million different goddesses. Athena as a symbol has very specific characteristics. Mm-hmm. And there are certain things Athena would do and certain things Athena would not do. There are certain things that Zeus would do, certain things he would not do. Hephaestus or Hephaestus, the, the wounded god, the only wounded god in the pantheon of the gods. There are, there are very, very specific aspects to his life. So when you begin to look at images, and this is really what our training program is about, You look at the image as an explication of a field, the image as a telling of the field that the dreamer is in. Now, what goes on with dream work today, and I'm going to put my cards on the table. I I really think Jung would be rolling over in his grave if he saw what was going on with modern dream work. 
Because mm. the beauty of Jung's work, I mean, look at his, his the body of research he did over 50 years, buddy. I mean, I know we're preaching to the choir here, talking to you about this. But he looked at the archetypes. He looked at the archetypal underpinnings. If, if an image can be understood simply through the lens of what you want it to be, well, for me, a spotlight is I want to be in the spotlight. It's about wonderful narcissism. A spotlight for an actor, a spotlight on a singer, a spotlight on a great athlete. A baby should be in the spotlight, so it's a beautiful dream. If an image is to be relegated to the bias of the dreamer, why in God's name would Jung or anybody have spent 40, 50, 60, 70 years studying symbols and images? Mm -hmm. Why did Jung go to study alchemy for so many years? He, he, he was taken by this theme for, for the past probably 15, 20 years of his life, the last 15 years. He studied alchemy, alchemical images, alchemical symbolism, because he realized the dreams of the negredo, the dreams of the whitening, the dreams of, of calcification. This isn't just the dream of what you think this means, oh, I should drink more milk because of the calcinatio. It's saying this is something that has been part of the repository of humanity from the beginning of time. Mm -hmm. And what that means so then is the image. The image is an eternal motif connecting us to these eternal wisdom traditions. And the wisdom is of that dream, the wisdom of the image, again, I'm going to put myself out here, is not going to be understood, and it's going to be missed if we simply say, well, for me, it means. Mm -hmm. For me, car, like I'm looking at cars out my office window. Oh, cars. Somebody could say, oh, my God, cars. I think about right. violence because of terrible things that happened in my life. I think about luxury. I think about Lamborghinis. I love car mechanics. I, I love working with cars and whatever. That's what cars are about. So cars are about my passion. Hey, it sounds like what you're saying is that when we only look at what a symbol means to me, and of course you're right, that's, that's what a lot of the, the training or at least even the articles that I hear out there are saying is, you know, what does it mean to me? I, I definitely think that's a step up from, you know, grabbing a, a, a dream symbol book and looking it up and assuming that it means whatever, you know, the dream symbol book says. However, um, what it sounds like you're saying is that it's actually almost like learning a new language. And once you understand the language and you're able to tap into what that image has to say and that you stick to the, the grammar or the discipline of, of what that interaction is, that's when the insight can come, rather than projecting onto it something that may or may not actually be true. Perfectly said. Because you, you see... One of the beautiful, again, many beautiful things that Jung said, he said, what do we do with images and symbols? Generally what we do is we make meaning of images. And everyone says, oh, yeah, all right, that's what we do. And he was laying a trap. He said, no, that's not what we should do. We don't need to make images because images and symbols have their own meaning. Mm -hmm. Why don't we engage them, enter their world? And I, and I mean it. I don't mean this in just some abstract way, Bonnie. This is what my work is really about. I'll give you an example in a minute. So what you said is perfect because what we do, and it's part of the hubris of the human condition, part of the limitations of the human condition, in that what we do is we cross-reference by what we know. Say you tell me you're from San Francisco. Oh, I've been there, and, oh, you got the great Chinatown, and you got the great Charlie cars, and, and you know, and I'll tell you my experience. So right. what we do is I will try to apprehend something about your world by what I'm aware of. Archetypes uh -huh. are from a different world. Archetypes... And Jung even said they have their own language, their own morphology, their own mythology. So when he said, learn to understand the nature of nature itself, how do things grow? And this is why I, I really was ahead of the curve 25 years ago when I began the first Italy conference, actually 22 years ago, in that it was one of the first transdisciplinary conferences out there. We had physicists and biologists and writers and Jungians together looking at this idea of symbolism, looking at the self-organizing systems, because we want to understand what is it that's intrinsic. Now, to ground this, I'll give you two examples, and one is from my own casework. Many years ago, when I was, I was young, <laughs> I was probably about, what, 34? Memories of a long time ago, <laughs> 32 years old. Anyway, a patient You're not that old. Dream, Come on. But anyway, a patient had a dream that one of these dreams you never, I never forget, she dreamt that she was out cross-country skiing in the dead of winter in Vermont. And here we have some big winters. And it was one of those days. It was about 10 below zero. And the sun was out. The, the snow was glistening. And it really is a beautiful time in Vermont. The snow just kind of 
crushes under your feet, and it's beautiful. Anyway, she's out there dressed appropriately and everything, and she's cross-country skiing. And as she's cross-country skiing, enjoying the day, feeling alive and vital, she suddenly sees a black bear out with her cubs frolicking in the snow. Now, let me step out of the dream for one second. This is one of the dreams that really got me working with this stuff, that got me looking at the world of the objective psyche and the power of the archetype to reveal and to shape and to transform. So, so she's out there, back into the dream. She's out there skiing. She sees this black bear with the cubs out, and she says, oh, my God, how beautiful, how wonderful, and oh, my God, look at them frolicking. and makes me think about all of the wonderful things I'm doing in my life, she says. And, and she was a 72-, 73-year-old woman at the time. And so we got to talking about the dream. As I asked the question anybody who works with a dream should ask, how do you feel about the dream? What do you think about the dream? What do you, what do you associate? What's conjured up with the dream? And she said, well, you know, I do love cross-country skiing, and, and seeing the bears being out in winter made me think about all of the, the extroverted things I'm doing in my life right now, she says. I'm, I'm getting involved in politics. I'm doing these marches in different states, going down to Washington, and getting really involved with community and all this kind of stuff. That dream is a wake-up call. Now, most of us, and I've done a lot of lecturing, and I often present that dream to see what people would say. And they say, oh, it's a beautiful dream. I say, okay. <laughs> Let's go back to the wisdom of the of the self and the wisdom of nature because they're one and the same. What would nature tell you about this dream? Not what you think, Bonnie or Conforti or Kaufman or anybody or even Von Franz or anybody who works the dream. Because, again, we're going to bring our constructions and our own project. I love your word. You had the right word. We project onto it. And once we project onto an image, we make it our own, and we say, this is right. It's only what I think it is. Now, if we talk to somebody who knows about the natural world, and you say, say you talk to a naturalist. Say, naturalist, can you, like you, you're an ethologist. Can you tell me about black bears? Remember, it wasn't a grizzly or a polar. Tell me about black bears in Vermont out in the dead of winter, like January, February. They well, can tell course, you one thing. They- yeah, they, they're supposed to be hibernating. They're not supposed to be out playing in the snow. Exactly. But you know what? You said that very quickly. This is part of your world. But you know what? 90% of people would have the same reaction to the dream that the dreamer did. How beautiful, how wonderful. They're frolicking. Don't you see that it's playful? It's beautiful? It's the mother-child relationship. It's a beautiful relationship of the maternal. Mm-hmm. Now, let's take it further. Right. The bear, a black bear in Vermont, should be deep into hibernation by January, February. Mm -hmm. Now let's ask the next question. What would a naturalist tell you if that bear was, in fact, out in January, February with the cubs? What is it telling you? It's telling you two major things. Even with global warming that we're having, and it's creating change. I mean, I know this is part of your study with the collapse of the bee colonies. But even with global warming, the bears are not coming out of hibernation that early. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's telling you two major things, and this is factual. Either the bear has some has had its den disturbed by some hiker or somebody. Somebody maybe stumbled onto a den and fell into it, who know, whatever, but they have disturbed, here's the word, the natural needs, the natural tendencies, the universal tendencies of that animal were disrupted by this human intervention, falling into it, stumbling into it, whatever. Now, it may have even been a hiker that was, you know, freezing, and they went into it not knowing what it was. Or the second thing is the brain, the bear had a uh, a brain problem, brain disease. It was some kind of infection or bacteria in the brain. Mm-hmm. And that happens Something up here Something that would actually count, counteract its instincts and bring it out at a time when it's not supposed to be out. E- exactly. Mm-hmm. Now, again, the consequences of whichever it was, then they're probably not going to be able to go back into hibernation at that point because they're entire. And specific things will destroy that capacity to thrive. This is factual. Now, now an argument could be, how could you, you, you say these things about the natural will and put it on a dream? Because the dream is an expression of psyche. The dream is a story of nature. Mm-hmm. Every image is embedded in the natural world. And what we do, now get back to your question, where do the images come from? The images are expressions of psyche telling us a profound story about a way of life. 
we will miss that story if we need to constantly need to project onto it. We will unlock that door or we will work with Psyche if we can take the time to say, you know what, what are you trying to teach me? Well, what happened in this case, I said, I said to him, what are you, all these things about your outer world activities right now and your, your march on Washington and blah, all of that stuff, I say for you, this is not just because you're older, for your psyche it's saying you need to be in hibernation. Mm-hmm. And I realized, because I was a young kid, so I mentioned I was young at the time, I was treating her as though she was young like me. Come on, get involved. Let's climb the ladder and climb the mountain. We're, we're young and whatever. I wasn't respecting the fact that she was, she needed something different. You mean in your and treatment then, with her or analysis with her, that's what had been going on. That was the trend. And then this dream came along to tell you something different. Is that what you're saying? Exactly. And also it showed me there was an entrainment that went on between what I was doing with her and what happened in her life. And the uh-huh. story is actually when she was five. You see, right away with the fact it's a mother bear and the two cubs, it's already telling you, this dream is trying to reveal and tell us a story about something about her world with a mother, uh-huh. the mother archetype and her own personal mother. But it was a tragic story. When she was five years old, the mother says, oh, honey, I'm going to go shopping. You, you stay here with your father and your brother. And they were all around the pool. The brother was maybe three. She was maybe six. And you and your daddy here, so watch your brother. Well, the, the father was a burnt-out alcoholic. The father, you see where this story's going. The father mm-hmm. got himself drunk, went on the chaise lounge and fell asleep into a drunken stupor. The yeah. brother's in the pool playing around, and she's a six-year-old little kid. The brother drowns in the pool. Now, you, you see, now, can you know all that from the dream? What you could say, if you're really skilled in this kind of work, is something traumatic happened in the mother-infant field, the mother-child field, and something as well in the treatment and in her life. And a dream like that is saying you better, the therapist and the patient need to really pay attention to the power of this. So, again, you asked the million dollar question, which is where do the images come from? They come from the self. And we're not going to apprehend the transcendent through the lens of the personal. Uh-huh. One has to ask what, what is known about black bears? What is known about bears in winter? That would have been a very different dream if it was a polar bear in Vermont. We don't have polar bears in Vermont. That would be telling you a whole other story. Right. So what this work asks you to do is to humble yourself and say, what is known about that image? Yes, I want to see what I think and what the dreamer thinks. And that's all important. I would never dismiss that. But what happened, what's happening in the field today for the past 10 years, pretty much in Jungian psychology and many of the approaches to dream, is that the, the work with the image is about fantasy and about all different words people use to say to dream the image forward, which means take it wherever you want to take it. And people then believe whatever your fantasies are and whatever your imaginings are is really about the image. And that's, not, that's very far from what is objectively true. It, it makes me think of a couple of things. Um, first of all, I, I remember a quote from Jung who talks about uh, unless you make the unconscious conscious, it directs your life, and, and then, in, you know, it shows up as fate. You think it's fate and that you're just living exactly. your life out of fate. But actually there are those images which are completely in control of our lives, and unless we can kind of wake up to what image is showing up in our lives and, and how it's living out its purpose in conjunction with what's going on in our lives, there, there's no way that we can understand. Uh, exactly. So it's a very powerful thing to be able to engage with these images and the second thing is that, you know, James Hillman talks a lot about, he has a really fascinating book called The Dream of the Underworld. I'm sure you've read it. Oh, yeah, and fantastic. And he talks about how we actually disrespect the images by bringing them out of where they live. You know, you talk about them coming from the other world. When we bring them out of where they live and we essentially morph them to fit whatever it is that we are trying to project on them, then we lose the capacity to understand their their true nature. It's exactly what you're saying. Maybe it's a different way of saying it. But as long as we allow them to continue to exist in their world where they are, which means true to their nature, true to their structure, those archetypal rules, because there are actually rules. So there's something about going to the image and engaging with it in its own form rather than bringing it out and expecting to engage with it in the way that we want to engage with it. Would you, would you agree with that? I, again, you, you're saying it perfectly. I mean, in terms of what I'm getting at, what Calf was getting at, what Jung was getting at, yes. It's respecting the autonomy of the image. That, mm-hmm. is, that doesn't happen when one does all the projecting onto it. 
I had a wonderful talk with, with a colleague. I really love this guy and respect him. Some of you know, Dennis Slattery. Yes, of course. Then he, he came to Italy two different times as a speaker because I really respect him. And anyway, we were talking, and you know, he said, Mike, I've been teaching your work for a long time. I've been uh, using your book, The Old Form of Fate, in my classes and all. And he said, it wasn't until I actually heard you lecture that I see the difference between what he's been teaching and what I've been saying. He said, you know, we do a lot of this archetypal, mythic, poetic uh, work with imagery. So say there's a dream. And he would encourage people to do poems around it and poetry and imagery and all that. He said, well, up, and, up until this point when he came to Italy with us, he said, I would then be thinking that whatever came up in the poem was an extension of the dream image. He said, now when I heard you lecture, and let's say you're using this dream as an example here, I, he said, I understand that the poetry and the imaginings that are coming in response to the dream may be wonderful poetry. It may be wonderful imagining, but it may not have anything at all to do with the dream. And he said, that's exactly Jung's point, because he said, look, Jung's point is that many times we have a dream image. A dream image, as I'm saying here, I hope it's clear, it has its own world, its own morphology, its own story, its own mythology. What we do is we often have a complex around the dream image. We complex around it. And Jung was very careful throughout his writings to say we need to be very careful in separating out and seeing the, and being discerning between the actual archetype in the dream that's inherent in the dream and the complex we have around that mm. and and dennis was so humble in that and so wonderful and he said oh my god i never realized michael that all of these the you know creative imagining and writing we do around it i believed it was a dream he said now i see it very differently this is exactly what i'm getting at that there is a difference and, and jung was really strident with this point there is a difference Dreaming right. of yeah, dream of money, that doesn't mean money is the corruption of all evil. You can say money is terrible, or money is all about the rich, or money is about this, or I wish I had more. Or you can have a million. We, can, we all complex around things. We complex around money, sex, religion. But the fact that we have our reactions to it does not mutate the objectivity of the image. So it seems like it, it's imp it could be important to do some of that imaging or poetry around those images, but much more to reveal what our complexes are rather than to actually take truth from what is being shown to us. Would you agree with that? You know what? I just understood that last year. What you just said, uh -huh. that insight just came with. Because my question was always, okay, look, if it's true that our associations and our images and imaginings are often really very different from the meaning of the dream itself. Why do we do it? And I realized, and, I, and you said it better than I did, I realized that our associations and imaginings reveal more about our complex than it does about the archetype. Wow, that's really powerful. <laughs> I, I hadn't incredible. thought about it until just now myself. And, and, of course, you know, as a trained depth psychologist, there's a lot of, of kind of conditioning in that um, realm of you need to get, to get at the unconscious, you really need to give it some kind of form other than, you know, straightforward language. So, so creating poetry or, or making a painting of your dream is a pretty standard practice in depth psychology. And so I, I kind of had this moment as you said that, and I thought, oh, wow, is that all wrong? And then, of course, what I'm realizing now is that it's not that it's right or wrong. It's, it's making that, that differential between what it is that you're actually doing when you create the art or the poetry coming from the dream. Yep. And so yep, I, th I exactly. just think it's really important to just differentiate between what those two practices are and make sure that we aren't, uh, again, just disrespect the autonomy of that image, as you said. Exactly. It's powerful stuff. Very powerful. Well, l let, me, let me leave you with one, one more dream, one of these dreams that really right. shook my life and I worked on it with somebody. It's a dream that I personally related to because, you know, I happen to love fishing, and it's a fishing dream, and, and I've raised my son as for many years, not anymore, but I was a full-time single father for around nine years. But anyway, the dream was of a father and son, both fishing from the shore. At the same moment, they both hooked a fish. They're a separate fish, okay? Their rods, independent of one another, bend all the way down. You know, when you catch a big fish, and, you know, for fishermen, I mean, that's an exciting moment. And here they're fishing in the ocean, by the way, not a lake, so it's deep unconscious. So they're both fishing. They catch a, they got a really big fish on the line, and father's excited because the father loves fishing. The son's excited. He, he's really enjoying fishing. And the son says to the father, Daddy, would you help me bring my fish in? 
And it's almost like a cartoon. You know how you, in the cartoons you look at your line, look at your, the other line, look at your line, look at the other one, the head's going back and forth I've 50 got times. got the image, yep. <laughs> and the father takes out his, his, his little knife and he cuts his own line hmm. to help the son bring his fish in. It's another one of these dreams. That is, it's a dream, Bonnie, is pure poetry. It's, it's mm-hmm. a, it could be a parable in any Bible, any, any spiritual sacred story. Mm-hmm. And that dream is saying that the father needs to know at this point in his life with his son, both the outer world son and the inner son, but take the outer world first. The father had a very successful career, very prominent in his work and profession. And the dream was saying, now you're both connected to something really very deep and powerful in the deep unconscious. Your work right now is to help your son bring in his fish, not yours. What is the dream saying? It's saying your work is to help your child bring that big fish in. That is one of the most important archetypal mandates of any parent, is we are there to help our children. But the dream... I mean, you could say it in so many words, Bonnie, but sometimes you get an image. I mean, that's the beauty of imagery. The image just said it all. In, mm-hmm. in what? In two lines, it said volumes, and it spoke about the dreamer's past. It spoke about the need of the dream. It spoke about the archetypal field that dreamer is in. It's all there. All there in a that, in that holographically encapsulated, encapsulated image. It's telling you the story. It's telling you an archetypal sacred story. Thing right now, Father, this is not your time to bring in all of your riches. Help your son bring in his. Mm. Now, of course, it also relates to the inner world of the of the patient who had that dream, his own inner son and all that. But also, he needed to know about that for his own son. And I said, this is your time. You have to make even more sacrifices than you realize, even more from your own career, your own advancements, and all of the wonderful things going on in your professional life. Some of them are going to be put on hold because your son is also hooked on to something very rich and very deep and very big that he has to bring in. It's just, it's a, yeah. like a destiny piece. Yeah, that's a really beautiful example. I'm glad that we're ending on that one. It's a, it's a really um, nice way as people listen to this and hopefully have learned some things from it and, and begin to consider whether or not they would like to plug into the Dream Patterning Program you know, it's a really powerful way to see how beginning to understand the language of dreams can be so powerful in our own lives and, and how respecting that nature is at the very core of depth psychology and what it is. And I know Jung talks about how as you go down through the layers of psyche and you get further and further to the bottom, then it really merges with nature. And so at the bottom of the psyche is nature itself. There's no differentiation between those. And when you start looking at dreams in those ways, you can just see how powerfully we can begin to align our lives with the dreams and with the, the images and the messages from the unconscious and, and begin to get on a path that will take us to our greater work in the world, whatever that is, whether it's raising kids, whether it's being in the political fray, whether it's um, working for causes, whether it's being in depth psychology, whether it's being an analyst, whether it's being an artist even, all of that can really be brought forth by just beginning to engage and listen to these images. And that's why I just think this program is so powerful. I'm going to be taking it this year, and I'm just really excited. Do you want to just give us, we have two minutes left, but maybe just give us a a quick rundown of what the the logistics are? Okay, we meet every other week by phone. It's uh, it's We do teleconference and residency format. It's a nine-month program. We meet every other Wednesday from 8 to 9.30 Eastern Standard Time. If you cannot make it, they're all archival, so it's going to be recorded. You can take them and tape them and listen whenever you want to. Then we have two residencies, which I'm really excited about. The first residency is the first weekend of November coming up, and that's going to be on archetypal fields. We have Beverly Rubick coming, a very well-known biophysicist. We have Richard Ott, who's a surgeon and a uh, a scholar in the new sciences coming. I'm going to be speaking. Uh, It's going to be a great, great weekend, really taking a lot of the theoretical backdrop of fields and archetypes. Then the second residency is the last weekend in May, and both are here in Brattleboro, Vermont. And the third component of the program is I offer two one-on-one uh, tutorials to anybody in the program. And Come, that's kind of a, a personal world. mentorship with you. Uh, exactly. One-on-one, exactly. right, yeah. Okay. Yep. It's evolving into a separate discipline. It's clear that it's, it's becoming a separate profession. I mean, archetypal pattern analysis, which I started years ago, is now recognized as a separate profession, which is wonderful. And only people that are graduates of our program can use that title. 
and the same with dream patterning. Yeah. Well, Michael, you've spent years, in fact, you've spent decades of your life working on this, and you have clearly developed it to a, you know, you've finessed it and refined it to something that is really powerful and really unique, and I don't see this program being offered anywhere else. And, and I think for those of us who go through the program and are able to benefit from the expertise of both yourself and also the guest speakers that you bring in, I, I mean, what a what an amazing gift! And really, it, it's not possible to say that someone is certified in this work unless they've actually been through and completed your program, because it's such a powerful, powerful work. And I'm just really grateful for the fact that you're bringing it into the world, and um, and I really look forward to learning more. Thank you very much for those kind words. I mean, I'm very proud of this, and, and I love the work. And it's funny to say, yeah, decades. It's three decades of my life. Mm-hmm. And it's been almost all-consuming, and, and I love this stuff more than ever. I really do. I mean, getting close well, to being able you. to articulate some of this work, it's fabulous. So thank yeah. you. Thank yeah, you it takes a while it. to get to that point. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing with us, Michael. Really, your work is, is making such a tremendous difference in my life and in the lives of so many people. So really grateful for that. Thank you for spending your time with us today, and uh, I look forward to seeing what's next. Thank you very much. 